Okay. So the first thing was I wanted to talk about was did you um, hear the story of the the Capitol police officer that was killed by being hit, hit in the head with a fire extinguisher during the protests? We heard something. I wasn't sure how he got hit. Right. Said he got hit in the head with a fire extinguisher. So, and it sounds like he ha he died of head trauma. So knowing the little, you know, knowing the, what you know of head trauma. So what they said, I'll tell you the story. They said the guy was hit in the head with a, um, with a fire extinguisher. He was knocked unconscious. He woke up. He went back to the police station and then he died at the police station about an hour after he was hit in the head. So knowing the different types of head trauma um, that you know, do you have any idea what type of injury he would have had? So we had a, a subdural, an epidural, and it's a cerebral, yeah, subarachnoid. What's that? That a terrible it, bleeding not inside the brain, not between the brain and the skin. So you think he had it actually in the brain itself? Correct. That's what I assume. If not, they would have seen it. Why would they? Why would you say they would see it? If it was subdural, they would see it. Why? How would they see it? It would be marked outside. No. No. Okay. So okay. let's look. Yeah, at but this. it wasn't. It was. It was in, So that, that's what makes me think it's an epidural. What's that? It was instant, instantaneously, right? So right. So he was hit in the head. Yeah, I'm just gonna. There's a lot of background noise, so I'm just going to mute everybody for a second. So he was hit in the head. He was knocked out. Okay. Then he woke up a couple of minutes later. He was able to, you know, um, walk for all intents and purposes, you know, to the police station. And he died again at the police, came unconscious and died at the police station. So that's basically a textbook epidural hematoma. So epidural means it's above the dura mater and wedged against the skull. So it's not in the brain. It's the lining, the tough lining, okay, of the brain and between the skull. And again, we don't know that he was hitting the side of the head. We just have to assume that. It doesn't mean that every epidural has to be hit in the side of the head. It's just that when it is struck to the side of the head, there's an artery right there. So it tends to lead to an epidural hematoma. So let's look at it. Classic, loss of consciousness, followed by a return of consciousness, which is called a lucid interval, followed by unconsciousness, okay? So that's exactly what this guy had. He was hit in the head, knocked out. He woke back up, and then he became unconscious again and died. So it was pretty much, you know, the classic story, especially if they tell us he was hit in the side of the head. It was pretty much the classic story of an epidural hematoma. Now, again, they haven't said what he died of. For all we know, he could die of a heart attack because the other three people, or five people died. Um, one was shot and killed, so that's obvious, okay? Um, and the three died of medical emergencies. So pretty much all of those were people who had, I would say, stress-induced heart attacks. Um, you know, uh, one they definitely know was a heart attack, the other two they assume. So, and then this guy died of, you know, blunt trauma to his head, which probably was an epidural hematoma. It was just too classic of, um, you know, of the presentation not to be an epidural hematoma. I mean, again, for all I know, he could have died of a heart attack. I mean, I don't know. But um, it just, you know, the fact that he was struck in the head with something, knocked out, woke back up, was okay for probably close to an hour, and then subsequently died again, definitely sounds like a, you know, in my mind, an epidural hematoma. So the only reason I'm bringing it up is that Again, could you imagine you were the, you know, the EMS responding to the police station and basically the guy says to you, or even, you know, you're responding to the scene. The guy says, yeah, I was hitting the head with a fire extinguisher. Um, maybe I was knocked out. I'm not sure. I'm fine now. Thanks for coming. You know, I'm okay. Right. And he said, oh, you know, he, he said, looks good. He's talking to us and everything like that. Again, when people are struck in the head, there's no way of knowing what's going on without a CAT scan. OK, especially people who are on blood thinners, but this guy wasn't on blood thinners, but there's just no way of knowing on, knowing what's going on. There what was, did you uh, see anything? You would probably see something on the outside. Like you a may, big, um, you may, you may have a bump. You may have a cut. You, you know, who knows? I don't know what was on the outside of this guy's head. You may or may not. But again, just because you don't see anything doesn't mean there's nothing going on internally. And I'll give you another classic example. There was a case in New Square probably two years ago where a mother was changing um, I'm sorry, a mother was, yeah, I think she was changing a baby, you know, under one year of age baby, and she put it on a countertop, like a kitchen countertop. 
the kid tumbled off the countertop. She turned it back for a second. The kid tumbled off, hit their head. Um, no reported loss of consciousness, really. The kid was crying when everybody got there. The first people that showed up were like, okay, you know, he looks like he's good, everything like that. Um, you know, I don't think he needs to uh, go to the hospital, okay? Um, then, and those were senior members, right? Those were guys who had been doing it for quite a while. And then a new guy came. Um, I don't know, he's probably, I'm thinking he probably was in a class, I guess maybe he was like class two or three years before that happened, he had taken class. Um, and he's like, no, you know, the kid fell off his head, he hit, it, hit, hit, hit his uh, head. There's no real way of knowing what's going on. You know, he should get checked out. And the family didn't want to go as usual, but he basically talked everybody into going and, and actually kind of annoyed the other Hatsola guys to the point they were kind of like, you know, we're more senior than you. You don't know what you're talking about. But anyway, another newer guy showed up and volunteered to drive the ambulance and they decided to go to Columbia. I don't know why, but they decided to go to Columbia. Uh, I personally probably would have gone to a closer hospital like Westchester, but whatever. They went to Columbia. Um, in route on the George Washington Bridge, the king became unresponsive. So he was crying when they put him in the ambulance. He was crying most of the way down to Palisades. Um, he started to get quiet as they approached the George Washington Bridge. They thought he just kind of was, you know, quiet and, and from crying so much, got tired and everything. But he became unconscious. They realized in back of the ambulance, they they shot over to Columbia. Um, and they were told by the neurosurgeon that if they had left that kid home, he would have been dead. So the kid basically had an epidural hematoma and he had a, you know, a decent bleed and he actually had neurosurgery. Now, one of the things that I probably neglected to say when I said this, kids' skulls are soft, right? They're not fused yet. So this kid had a significant amount of bleeding, but didn't have really the kind of symptoms you would think he had for a longer period of time, because if the skull is soft, it's able to expand. And if it's able to expand, it's not putting pressure on the brain. So you're not seeing the signs you would normally see. So with this kid, you know, he was even further along than you and I would be because we would have become unconscious quicker, uh, probably plus and minus. Again, it gave a little more time to get down to Columbia. Um, but, you know, the issue would have been, let's say that the older members, you know, prevailed and, and convinced everybody to stay home. And uh, the probably what would have happened is the mother would have put that kid to sleep. And, you know, two or three hours later, when he didn't wake up, go and check on him, he would have been dead. So, again, there's no way of knowing what's going on in somebody's head. OK, without looking inside it, which we cannot do. OK, there's no way of knowing what's going on. So you never could be faulted for transporting somebody with head trauma, even if it doesn't look like there's any trauma on the head to the hospital. So just something you need to remember. Again, we don't know definitely that that police officer had an epidural hematoma, but based on the signs and symptoms, I would say he did. Okay. Um, and again, like that little kid that they took care of, you know, if it wasn't for those, you know, those two new guys, he probably would be dead at this point. And turned out like everything in New Square, he happened to be related to a whole bunch of guys on Hatsola. Um, so, you know, it was, it was firsthand, you know, knowledge of what was going on with the kid, you know, while he was in the hospital and everything like that. Okay, so now Prima, what other symptoms will you have when you have subdural than the epidural? So the only difference will be the speed. There's no other. There's no other um, symptoms. In other words, you could still be knocked out with a subdural. Okay, you're still going to wake up because the the knocking out is the blow to the head, right? That's what knocks you out is that blow to the head. Just like anytime you bang your head, you could be knocked out and then you wake back up. OK, whether you become how fast you become unconscious depends if it's a venous bleed or an arterial bleed. Obviously, arterial bleeds bleed faster and put more pressure. So that's the only reason why epidurals typically become unconscious, say, in the first couple of hours, where subdurals most of the time take days to weeks. There are there is a thing called an acute subdural. Um, I'm just trying to hear. See, acute subdural will be minutes to hours, but they're rare. Most subdurals are um, take days to develop. OK, even weeks, some of them like, you know, I told you President Reagan had one. It took months to develop. So, you know, Hillary Clinton had one. It took a week to develop. So, I mean, it really depends on how fast the bleeding is. And if it's a vein, most of the times it's not that fast. There's even so the question is, do you have an option of epidural and not have symptoms outside like marks outside? Yes. I mean, so, again, you would think if somebody was hit with the force to fracture their skull and cause bleeding, there would be. But again, nothing's 100%. You know, you don't know. I mean, or maybe you miss it. You know, so just because there's no outside trauma 
doesn't necessarily mean that somebody does not have a head injury. Okay. Okay. So again, is the symptoms the same as um, when there's a spinal cord injury? No, because the spinal cord is different than the brain, right? Here, we're so the brain and the spinal cord make up your central nervous system, but they're two separate organs, right? So your brain is your brain, your spinal cord is your spinal cord. So spinal cord injuries you're, typically do not do cause not unconsciousness. unconsciousness. Right. Right. So, so like, oops, I'm getting an echo. So, so, um, you know, somebody who has a spinal cord injury, okay, usually you would have, if you have a true spinal cord injury, you'd have paralysis. People with brain injuries, you don't know whether or not they're paralyzed because they're unconscious. So, you know, but again, somebody with a straight spinal cord injury, if they didn't have a brain injury on top of it, probably would be able to talk to you and tell you they can't move because it's not, you know, the, the injury to the cord is not going to interfere with the brain working because the cord is below the brain, right? The cord is what sends the signals to the brain and from the brain. Okay, so let's go back to um, spinal cord injuries. Okay, so the, the, in, the incidence or the amount of spinal cord injuries is pretty low. I mean, you know, out of everything you're going to see, there's not a lot of people that have spinal cord injuries. Okay, so here we wrote assume possible cervical spine injury based on mechanism of injury and physical exam. Now, the reason I put that, now mechanism of injury is how the patient got hurt, right? MOI, mechanism of injury. So, you know, was it a car accident? Did he fall off a, a trampoline? That would be mechanism of injury. And physical exam is how you uh, assess a patient, right? So years ago, we based the need to immobilize somebody's spine on mechanism of injury, which meant that every single person that was in a car accident, every single person who had a fall, you know, no matter what, even if they were moving everything, turning their heads, you know, they, they were moving their arms, they didn't have any numbness or tingling, we still did cervical spine immobilization, okay? They found that that was totally unnecessary. And it re resulted in, you know, uncomf you know uh, an uncomfortable transport for the patient, unnecessary x-rays and everything like that. So now we base it on how did they get hurt and what's going on with their body? You know, are they moving everything? Do they have any numbness or tingling? Do they have any pain in their neck, any pain in their back? So we kind of, just like we should have all the time, you know, not just based it on the fact the guy told us that he was in a car accident, you know, and that's why we we're mobilizing him. So, you know, things kind of changed. Okay. So we'll talk about that whole theory um, because, you know, it's very rare nowadays that we you know, put people on long boards and tie them down and do all the crazy stuff that we used to do years ago. And New York was one of the last states to change it, right? I mean, it had been changed in Canada for probably 10, 12 years before New York did. Canada was one of the ones out in front with saying, you know, the way we're doing things is wrong. In the United States, Maine was um, one of the first states. And, um, you know, New York, like everything in New York, were kind of slow to adopt things. So we know that the spinal cord is the connection between the computer, which is the brain, and the rest of the body, right? So signals from the rest of the body go up the spinal cord to the brain, and the brain sends information. The brain sends commands, okay, to all the parts of the body through the spinal cord, right? So it's basically the big network cable coming into the brain, going to the rest of the body. There are nerves in the brain, okay, that can send messages to other parts of the brain without going through the spinal cord. And those are called your cranial nerves. So there's uh, there's um, 12 cranial nerves. The 10th cranial nerve is the vagus nerve, which is the one that gives us the problems with what we call vasovagal, where people's heart rates slow down, their blood vessels dilate, like when they see blood and strain on the toilet and stuff like that. And then when we were doing the, the lecture on head injuries, we talked about there's one that controls your eyes. You know, there's actually a couple that control your eyes and smell. So those, even in somebody who has a spinal cord injury, are still going to work because they don't go through the spinal cord. Um, and, um, just, you know, just again, just to realize that not every single signal to the brain is going to be interrupted when somebody, um, has spinal cord injury. So I'll give you an example. You know, I was on somebody who had a legitimate spinal cord injury, couldn't move his lower extremities. And somebody says, well, I don't think he does because his pupils are working. And I said, what does that have to do with anything? Well, if he had a spinal cord injury, his pupils wouldn't be working. I said, mm, I'll explain to you later. This was a paramedic. I said, I'll explain to you later, but you're totally wrong. And, you know, later I told him, I said, you know, that was like really stupid to say. Because that brain, the brain would uh, cause something like that. Right, exactly. Brain injury. Because the, the nerves that control your eyes are cranial nerves. They come right from the brain to the eyes. They don't go through the spinal cord. 
So, you know, just to say somebody, somebody who says they can't move to say it's not a spinal cord injury because their eyes are working is kind of silly. No, again, it could be something. Somebody may not be able to move their lower extremities because they broke all their bones. That, and that doesn't have to be a spinal cord injury, right? But I mean, this person, the story was basically cleaning leaves and fell off a ladder in a seated position and described, described to everybody that he heard his spine crack. He said, I heard my back crack and he couldn't move his lower extremities. So for somebody to come along and say, well, because his pupils are working, he doesn't have a spinal cord injury, it makes no sense. Because again, the eyes are closed. I mean, I'm sorry, the eyes are controlled by nerves that don't go through the spinal cord, okay? Okay, so again, when we talk about primary injuries, that means that the spine is injured by the impact. Secondary injuries mean it's, hap it's injured by swelling that's putting pressure on it. So we'll talk about the two different ways as we go on, but uh, just in case they you know, throw those terms out again. Okay, so there's a lot of different mechanism of injuries that can cause spinal cord injuries. Years ago, before seatbelt and airbag use, probably car accidents were the number one reason. Um, nowadays, it's mostly probably sporting events, you know, diving into water where you can't see the bottom, especially, you know, lakes or shallow swimming pools and stuff like that. Um, trampolines were a big one years ago, but most trampolines have the nets around them now. So it would only be trampolines where people didn't install the nets or, you know, whatever, the nets are not working or something like that. Um, you could still see them once in a while, what, like bicycle accidents, um, you could see it with falls. The other day they had somebody that was working on a pretty tall ladder, like almost like a 20 foot high ladder in a house that was being built and he fell off. Um, and there was a question of whether or not he had a spinal cord injury or it was just pressure on his spine from the injury. So they have to you know, wait days to see as the pressure goes down, if he regains movement and stuff like that. So you know, most of the times nowadays, it's probably diving or falls or something like that. Okay, so now what happens? And again, none of these terms are gonna be on it, but just to understand. So in a car accident, right, depending on how the impact is, you're either gonna go backwards or you're gonna go frontwards. So your cervical spine in your neck is not well supported, plus it's got about a 25 pound ball on top, right, your head. So that when you flip back and forth, okay, there's not a lot supporting your head, especially if you don't have your headrest in the right position. Okay. Now, what I mean by the right position is that your headrest should be behind your head. Somebody who's really tall, if the headrest is in the lowest position, what's going to happen is that when their head flips back, it's going to be right behind the base of their skull and their neck, and their head is going to flip further over it. You know, so that's the old typical, what they call a whiplash injury. So your, your, um, your headrest should be that your head should not be able to flip back past it, right? It should stop your head. That's why there is a headrest. It's not really for comfort. It's actually a safety um, feature. And some of the fancier, newer cars, when it senses you're going to crash, it actually does two things. It brings the headrest forward to meet your head, okay? And it also tightens up on your seatbelts um, so that if you do have uh, a collision, you know, you're in a little bit of a better, safer, uh, you know, safer place so to speak. Um, so again, you could have it either way, okay? Uh, it doesn't matter that we, you know, don't worry about how the spine is injured. They're never gonna ask that. But just so you understand, you know that the spinal column is a series of bones, right? Discs or bones that sit on top of each other. And then running through them, let me see if I actually have a picture. Uh, I can't see your screen. Is it just me or is it everyone? Oh, it, the screen share is not on? I can't see. I'm yeah, not it's sure. It's on. No, it's on, it's on. It's on? Okay. I don't know why I can't see, but okay. Um, are you just, are you on, what do you want, a tablet, laptop? Tablet. I saw it before. I don't know what I did and I just lost it. I don't know. Well, sign out and sign back in. I'll wait a second. Just, or, you know. Okay, I'll do that. Just, just and I'll just talk. So, so, um, I'll just give him a second. I don't want to go too far ahead. Gotcha now, thank you. Okay. Okay, so again, there's different ways the spine could be hurt. Okay, so th they're not gonna go into the terms, but extension means it's going backwards. Flexation means it's going forward like here. Um, so, you know, when somebody used to have a car accident and they didn't have their seatbelt on, a lot of times they could go this way or they could go backwards. So they could either have extension or flexation, typically diving, will cause a flexation where, you know, when you hit your head, it bends forward. Um, 
rotational ones are pretty rare. That's more of like sporting, uh, sporting good, I'm not sporting good, sporting injuries and stuff like that, where you'll see that. Okay. Now, what I was saying before, and I'll, I'll have to find a picture of the spine in a second, is that the, the spinal bones, right, the, the different parts of the spinal column, um, they're held in place with what's called ligaments. And you remember when we did fractures and stuff, ligaments are like bands of rope that hold joints in place. And every one of your 33 spaces, your 33 vertebrae is considered a joint because they're movable. So if your ligaments are overstretched, the actual bones have ability to move, right? So if they start moving sideways, I'm trying to get my hand in front of it. If they start moving, remember it's, it's just a circle with the spine going through it. So if they start moving like this, and the spine is going to get trapped, it's going to get crushed, and it won't work because of the pressure. So, you know, that's one of the issues. So sometimes it's not actually a fracture, like they'll say a spinal cord, spinal column fracture. That means the, the bones themselves broke. But sometimes it could just be that the ligaments move out of alignment, and they're putting pressure because the, the, the hollow hole that the cord runs through is now moving they'll put pressure on it. Again, it's semantics. It doesn't matter for all we care. They have an injury. Okay. Compression injuries are typically when they fall. Okay. It can be, you know, most of the times we talk about that, like a sitting injury. Okay. Um, in football, sometimes they make what they call a spearing tackle where they go head first into the person that could cause it. Again, diving injuries could cause it. It depends. It just depends. Like here, the neck's not flexed is what they're basically telling you. The other ones, the neck is flexed. Okay. And then, you know, some other very rare ones. Distraction means that the spinal, uh, the top two spinal vertebrae are actually separated. That usually requires a hanging to happen. Okay. And then penetrating means something's gone in there. A knife, a bullet, or something like that has gone in and severed the cord. Right. So those are pretty rare. Okay. Um, so this is not showing you a good picture of um, of what we're trying to say, but you know, I guess the the thing that would be is that your your spinal column, okay, over here, and I mean these are the little finger-like projections after it. Your cord is kind of running through down in here. So if any of one of these, each one of these is movable, right? Each one of these uh, vertebrae are movable. So if they start moving sideways, they're going to put pressure on the cord that's going down through it. I'm just going to try to see if I find a better uh, picture. Okay. Um, this is the reason why in the back of the ambulance, sitting on the bench or sitting on the CPR seat are the most dangerous places for us to sit because if there's a crash, your head is, you're going to go sideways, right? Because the head, the picture the ambulance is traveling in this direction, you're sitting sideways. So really the safest place to sit in an ambulance is the captain's seat, which is right up, you know, in front of the um, stretcher, because there you're sitting in a normal position, you might be facing backwards from the impact, but that's even going to help you more. The problem with the captain's seat is that you really can't do a good job um, managing the patient if you're just at their head, right? If you're doing airway, yes, but if you have to do anything else, you're not in a very good position. So again, there's a lot of different ways, okay? Now, what do we consider high risk, okay? So they say falls from greater than three feet, okay? Um, accidents like diving injuries, which is the fancy term is called axial loading, where they're putting pressure, they're compressing the head down on the spine, okay? And then high-speed crashes, especially if it's with rollovers, because obviously the person's gonna be, even if they're seat belted, they're still gonna bounce around a little bit, or if the patient's ejected, okay, out of the car, falls, you know, they're not seat belted and they're thrown out of the car. Most people who die from ejection die from beginning on, a, you know, hitting another, being hit by another car, right? In other words, they're thrown from the vehicle and then either the, the car they're in runs them over or falls on them or they're hit by another vehicle. Okay, uh, bicycles, obviously, all-terrain vehicles, you know, quads and stuff like that are also a big one, okay? Um, and, you know, there's other things we'll talk about that can do it, okay? So, these are all possible um, reasons why. But, you know, I mean, listen, I've had people who have fallen in their house downstairs and had a spinal cord injury. It's just not common. It's just very, very rare. So what they basically say is the more energy that was involved, the more likely there is for there to be a spinal cord injury. Okay. Okay. So um, there's two types, right? So it's a spinal column injury. That's the bone. Okay. Remember, there's the, there's the um, 
bones of the column, and then there's the cord, which is the nerve that runs through them. So it says a spinal column injury can occur with or without a spinal cord injury. So what it means is you could break a piece of this bone, okay? You know, you could fall, be struck, something like that. You could be broke, break a piece of bone. So you technically have a spinal column fracture, but the cord wasn't involved. So you're going to be in pain. It's going to hurt a lot, but you're not paralyzed. And then it says a spinal cord injury can occur with or without an injury to the column. So what that's saying is that you could have an injury where the bones are not broken. But again, if these pieces slide sideways, if one of these pieces goes out of alignment, since the cord is running through it, and it's a little hard to see here because we're not actually looking at the part where the cord goes through. But if one of these, if the cord's running through and one of these things moves sideways, it's going to catch the cord and put pressure on it. The other thing too is that your spinal cord doesn't go all the way to the bottom. Your spinal cord goes about to L2. So you could have a fracture, injury, anything devastating down through here, okay, and you would not be paralyzed. The only problem you could run into is that there's a canal, right, that the cord runs through. There's, a, in other words, there's a, a tube that the cord is in, and that connects right up into the wrappings of your brain. So your dura matter, your pia matter, your um, arachnoid membrane, all of those linings that line the brain also line the spinal cord. So if you were to have a devastating injury here where you actually broke something, the cerebral spinal fluid could leak out and you need cerebral spi spinal fluid to keep everything lubricated. So, you know, I mean, it's those are these are, but these are all such rare things. I mean, they really, really don't happen. Remember for the exam, you need to know there's 33, right? Um, uh, 33 vertebrae, right? There's seven in the cervical, which is the neck. Okay, there's 12 in the thoracic, right, which is your um, upper back, your chest, the back, the, the, the part of your back that's we, you know, the front we would call your chest. There's, a second, there's another five in your lower back. These are the biggest, strongest ones because your entire body is supported on it. Okay, so your lower back, your lumbar has five. And then your sacrum and coccyx do have technically individual pieces. So it's five and then four, this little tiny piece down here is four individual pieces, um, but they're fused together. So they don't look like they're individual pieces. So Question, if you, total. if you have an accident or whatever, you lose some spinal fluid, would it come like, can you get new ones? Or it'll yes. Go back or you get, yes. Okay. yes, you replace, you do, you do replace. Um, so you do lose all day long. You are losing a little bit. Okay, and then you are, you know, your body does replenish it. Yes, absolutely. It's just a question of if you have a massive loss of it, it would not replace itself in time before there would be damage. Okay. Now you're gonna you're gonna hear uh, this term. I mean, again, it depends how long you stay in, you know, medicine, but you're gonna hear this term where they say they have a spinal cord transection. Okay. So transection means that the cord itself was severed. So if you have a you have a wire, and it's as if the wire was cut. There's nothing that they could do for that person. They are going to be paralyzed for the rest of their life. Okay. Once the cord is cut, there's no repair. It doesn't regrow itself. It doesn't fix itself. There's nothing they could do. What they have had some success with, I don't know if you've ever seen these pictures, but they basically put the, the person wears a, um, a suit that is connected to their brain that is um, basically like a metal splint and the brain it, so it takes the signals from the brain, just like your brain tells you you want to walk and your legs move. So it says the same thing. In other words, the person decides they want to move and it sends the signals to, you know, this is all computer operated, obviously, but it sends signals to the splint, to the metal splint wrapped around the patient's legs to move the legs as if that person was walking. Except, you know, they're totally encased in kind of like a metal frame and that's what's actually lifting and moving and there's motors and, you know, it's, it has to be plugged in. Um, to charge up. I mean, it runs off batteries, you know, when they're moving, but I'm just saying it's, it's battery operated, but it does give that person, you know, a semblance of movement. They could actually pick things up, you know, um, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's the only thing they could do. There's no such thing as a transplant or a fixing it of it or anything like that when somebody has an injury. Now, the higher up the injury is, the worse it is. Because picture, the brain is the computer, if you cut the wire right when it comes out the computer, no signals get anywhere. If you were to cut it, right, say down here, well, your arms are going to work, your breathing is going to work because all those nerves are above here. Okay, what's not going to work is anything below it. So you're probably not going to have any feeling, say, below your diaphragm if you cut it over here. Your legs are not going to work. 
and so on. So the higher up the injury, the worse it is. So cervical spine injuries are worse than thoracic spine injuries. Thoracic spine are worse than lumbar, right? And again, lumbar, once you get below L2, L3 and below, the cord's not running through there. So it's not that it's good that you break the bone, but it's not going to result in a devastating you know, injury because there's no spinal cord uh, down there and stuff like that. One question for you. Mm -hmm. um, when you, let's say if you hit something by your, uh, you know, the mid part below your stomach, you know, on the back, but right? you mm -hmm. do something, you damage your, your back, your would lumbar. the automatic stuff in your body still work? Meaning, you know, the stuff that go, that you don't have control of, would that your, work? Or so yes nothing? and no. So he's asking a good question. So he's saying, would your autonomic nervous system still work, which is the part that runs even when you're sleeping, right? That's the automatic part. So the signals for the autonomic nervous system come through your spinal cord. So obviously if you have an injury, it's not gonna work. So his question is, what's gonna happen, right? So if it's down here, I would say he's gonna have problems urinating, okay? That would be one thing. He probably have some, some, have some problems uh, moving food, right? So whatever is gonna be controlled down this low. So, it, you know, again, if it's above, you know, if it's above the top of the lumbar, that means his breathing is going to work and all everything up here is going to work, his arms and legs and everything like that. So down here, it's probably going to be legs not working. And again, it depends how bad the injury is, but legs not working. He may have problems with urination. He may have problems moving food through. This may be a person who has to be artificially fed through a tube into their stomach, probably have to wear a, a urinary bladder, you know, catheter to urinate into a bag. Uh, probably will have to have a colon, uh, uh, what's it called? Well, where they connect their intestine to the outside. So when they go to the bathroom, it's in a bag on their outside. So that's all the types of things that may or may not happen. It just depends on how bad the injury is. Okay, so higher cervical injuries are gonna be a total loss in the ability to breathe because the nerves that control the diaphragm and intercostals and make them contract and relax are not gonna work, okay? Down lower, okay, the diaphragm may still function, but the, the um, the nerves that control your intercostals won't work. So what does it mean for us? It means that one of the things we have to assume if somebody has a cervical spine injury is that we're gonna have to ventilate them because this one, they absolutely have to be ventilated or else they're gonna die, they can't breathe. So, I mean, they'll stay alive for a little bit, you know, minutes and stuff like that, but they're not gonna, they're gonna have a hard, hard time getting adequate tidal volume, okay, if they can't, um, you know, move their diaphragm and intercostals. This one, okay, their diaphragm is still functioning, so you would have to assess the patient and see is oxygen enough or do they actually need to be ventilated? Remember, most of your breathing is your diaphragm. So never know. I mean, this person may function perfectly well on their own. They may need some ventilatory support. I'll tell you that when they get to the hospital, they're absolutely gonna get intubated. So if we don't intubate them in the field, they're gonna get intubated because until they know what's going on, like in other words, they may say, okay, now he looks fine, at night, we don't know what's gonna go on, right? And, so, and people aren't gonna be standing by his bedside all night long. So it'd be easier to intubate him and put him on a vent. This way, you know, he's being, you know, ventilated than it would be to find him in the morning dead because, you know, he can't move and now all of a sudden he stops breathing and he can't tell anyone. So, but if for us, you know, BLS wise, whether or not you need to ventilate him with a bag valve mask depends on how well he's breathing. So if you see his chest moving up and down, his pulse ox is still good, okay? Then you know that he's still ventilating well on his own. Now, what happens with somebody who has a true spinal cord injury high up? So somebody, you know, very intelligent just brought this up, right? So there's a thing called spinal shock. Some books call it spinal shock. Some things called neurogenic shock. It's one of the distributive shocks where the shock is not caused by blood loss. It's caused by vasodilation. So somebody just said, you know, that the autonomic nervous system is going to be interrupted when somebody has a spinal cord injury. And they're absolutely right. Okay. So there's two divisions to the uh, autonomic nervous system. There's the sympathetic which we call the fight or flight. That's what makes your heart beat faster, harder. That's the adrenaline type of thing. It makes your blood vessels constrict and it makes your blood pressure higher. If the sympathetic, which those are the nerve pathways that come through the spinal cord are interrupted, then the parasympathetic that we said was the 10th cranial nerve that doesn't go through your spinal cord still works. So if the one that makes things constrict and go faster doesn't work, but yet the one that slows down the heart and makes vasodilation work, you're gonna drop your blood pressure, right? So what happens? When you have a true spinal cord injury, okay, since those signals can't get down to your, to your body because the spinal cord injury, the spinal cord is interrupted, then the parasympathetic is still gonna work because it doesn't go through your spinal cord. This is your 10th cranial nerve, right? Your vagus nerve controls this one. 
So you're going to have vasodilation and bradycardia. So picture you have a pump that's running through some tubes, okay, and it's keeping a certain pressure in those tubes. Now you tell that pump to slow down how fast it's pumping, and you increase the size of those tubes. That means there has to be less pressure, right? If the pump's not running as hard as it used to be, okay, and you you uh, increase the size of the the tubes that the pump has to pump through, there's going to be less pressure. So that's exactly what happens in the body. Okay. Now, typically when somebody goes into shock, because remember, this is a form of shock, we said we expect cool, pale, sweaty skin, cool, pale, diaphoretic skin. But that's the typical presentation. In distributive shock, what happens because there's vasodilation, right, what happens? The warm blood, okay, comes up to the surface. So initially in distributive shock, the skin's warm. Again, your skin is normally dry, right? You're not usually sweating or anything like that. So it's, it's, it's warm, normal skin, warm, dry skin. Okay. If it's a spinal cord injury patient that's a victim of massive trauma, they could just be having a low blood pressure. So I, I guess what I'm saying here at the bottom here, where it says, you know, most likely the cause of hypotension, any trauma patient's hypovolemia is that if you have somebody who fell off a roof, okay, and landed on their head, and that's the extent of their trauma, and yet they have no blood pressure, and they're bradycardic, okay, it's probably a spinal cord injury. If you have somebody that's hit by a car at a high speed and thrown across the road, and then that you know you think they have a spinal cord injury, they may, but they also probably have massive trauma to their chest, to their abdomen, and probably even their head. So it's kind of hard to tell then when they're in shock, where's the shock coming from? But again, on a BLS level, even on ALS level, what do we care? All we're doing is taking them to the hospital. We're gonna minimize the amount of movement. We're gonna put them on oxygen or ventilate them. We're gonna try to keep them steady and warm, but there's not much, doesn't really matter. Like in other words, the ultimate reason why somebody has this injury or doesn't have this injury, most of the times doesn't matter to us if we do our basics, because we're not definitively caring for this patient, right? We're just keeping the patient alive till we can get them to the hospital. So I'm sure you've heard the term paraplegic, okay, or paraplegia. So paraplegic is basically somebody who's paralyzed, okay? Um, so there's, there's, you can be paralyzed halfway through or all the way through. So a quad, a quadplegic means four, quad means four. That means their arms and legs, okay, are paralyzed. A paraplegic usually means that they um, just lost the use of their lower extremities. So in a paraplegic, usually the injury is in their lumbar spine, okay? Because again, if it's down here, everything above it still works. If it was the injury was here, then everything below it doesn't work, okay? So it typically results from a spinal cord injury at the level, really should say below the thoracic, okay? Not the, um, because thoracic here, if you had an injury, depending how high up it is, it might shut your arms off too. So it really depends on how high it is, okay? So again, big picture, doesn't really matter as far as treatment and stuff. This is just more for information stuff. Now a quadriplegic, okay, since the injury is high up in the neck, then nothing's gonna work. Their arms and legs are not gonna work. And also remember in that case, you're absolutely gonna to have to ventilate them. Okay. So these, that's the most devastating type of spinal cord injury. Okay, so signs and symptoms of a possible spinal cord injury. Okay, tenders means it hurts in the area of the injury. So that can be true, okay. I've had people who've you know, injured their spine and said they heard bones crack. They have excruciating pain. Remember, if you, if you, brack, if you break a vertebrae, which is a piece of bone, the pain is similar than if you broke your arm. You know what I'm trying to say? In other words, if you break a bone, it doesn't really matter much where the bone is. It just matters that you broke a bone. So the fact that you broke a bone in your vertebrae, say in your neck or your back, it's gonna be just as painful as you break your finger or your arm or anything like that. Um, so they will still complain of pain, okay? Um, the question always comes in depending on where the fracture is and where the injury is, they may not feel it, right? So if somebody has a uh, injury high up, I'm just trying to get back high up, you know, somebody has an injury high up and they also have injuries below it, they may not feel any of these injuries just because the signals, right, the sensory nerves that are sending the signal back up to the brain to say there's pain, it's not working because they can't get through the site of the injury because the cord is cut. So you can have people, I remember that that picture I showed you of the guy with the two by four into his side, right, that I had and stuff, well, he had no pain. He had no pain whatsoever. Okay. He couldn't move his lower extremities because when it came in, it came in on an angle like this and it took out amongst a lot of other organs, it took out his lumbar uh, vertebrae, his lumbar spinal cord. So he couldn't move his lower legs, but he had no pain anywhere. Okay. Because the injury 
was pretty much at the level of where the spinal cord injury was. So he felt pressure, he felt the wood in him, but he didn't really have any pain, stuff like that. Okay, so some people, okay, will have pain associated with movement. Some people have pain all the time, okay? Um, some people will have pain if you palpate along their spinal cord. So again, pain is a common, a common theme and stuff like that. So pain, 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 right? So it doesn't matter where the pain is. Somebody has a good mechanism injury of a spinal cord injury and they have pain, we're going to assume they have one until proven otherwise, and then we'll talk about what we do to help stabilize their spine, okay? Now, pain that comes and goes, okay, um, is that's not so common. So in other words, they have pain and they don't have pain. Usually that's something else. That's usually like a ligament issue or a disc issue between the vertebrae, but it's not usually a spinal cord injury, okay, if it comes and goes and stuff like that. Now, the most definitive um, sign of a spinal cord injury in a man, or at least spinal shock and spinal cord injury, would be they have an erection. Because again, we said to get an erection, you have to have vasodilation. So we said in spinal shock, there's massive vasodilation. So in a man who has an erection after an injury to what you think is spine, okay, that's a, that's a definitive sign. Again, that's called prior prism. Okay. Uh, numbness and tingling in the extremities. So just like, that would be like, you know, you sometimes fall asleep on your arm, and then where you, you're, you're sitting on your leg and, and then all of a sudden, you know, you sit back up. So what happened there is that you were putting pressure on the nerves and you were also cutting off the blood supply. So for all intents and purposes, you kind of temporarily deprived that extremity of what it needed. And then when you all of a sudden give it back, okay. So when you first lift the weight off, you're sitting on your leg, when you first stand up, it's numb because it wasn't getting enough blood and the nerves were kind of like shut down for a second. And then you, you'll notice when you try to walk, right, you're stumbling. So that's the weakness part of it. And then as it reperfuses, that's when you get the tingling in it and stuff like that. So it's the same thing that people may feel, not that they have a true spinal cord injury, but they have probably pressure on it, like they've injured it, but it's not broken. It's not transected. It's not permanently damaged because if it was, it's not going to get better. Okay. Now, loss of sensation or paralysis below the site of the injury is definitely a sign of a cord transection. In other words, the cord has been uh, cut. So if they can't feel, okay, or they can't move below a certain point, that means that right above that point that they can't feel or can't move, that's where they had the spinal cord injury, okay? So same, same basic thing, okay? Um, um, if the injury is high up in their neck, okay, then obviously we said that their intercostals and their um, diaphragm may be involved, so they're gonna have difficulty breathing, okay? Sometimes you can see what they call belly breathing, where it doesn't look like their chest is trying to breathe, but it can look like they're trying to move their belly a little bit, their abdomen a little bit to try to suck in some air, okay? Again, they're gonna lose control of their bladder and they're gonna urinate. They can lose control of their bowel and they're gonna to go to the bathroom if because they can't control those nerves down there that are telling the muscles to keep everything closed, okay? And just like we said over here, inability to you know uh, move and everything, so they can't walk, they can't move their limbs, they can't feel like if you're pinching them or something like that, they can't feel it, okay? Um, so it's all the same things and stuff like that, you know, that we were just talking about, you know, and again, the big thing would be the impaired breathing. Okay, so we all talked about this all already too. Remember, neurogenic shock can happen with a spinal cord injury, okay? Um, it can't really happen any other way. So like there's a, there was a test question that described a, um, somebody who definitely had a brain injury. And it said, what are the, some of the possible side effects of somebody having, you know, a definite brain injury. And they list that one of them is neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock is not an injury of the brain. It's an injury of the spinal cord. So you should not have a vasodilation and drop in blood pressure from somebody who has a head injury because the sign of a head injury is high blood pressure and bradycardia, right? Where the sign of a spinal cord injury is low blood pressure and bradycardia. So again, low blood pressure, more of a spinal cord injury, high blood pressure, more of a head injury, a closed head injury rising into cranial pressure, okay? Now, older people, okay, are more likely to injure the spine for a lot of different reasons, okay? They're more likely to have falls, okay? So they could have falls from dizziness, they could have falls from being unsteady, they could have falls from houses that are not made for safe for them. In other words, there's loose rugs, or something like that. So, you know, just in general, elderly people are more likely to fall. If you're more likely to fall, okay, you're more likely to have a spinal cord injury. Then the second reason is that as we get older, okay, 
we have more problems with our bones, right? They become brittle. They're, they, they may um, have osteoporosis. You know, they may have like uh, diseases of the bone and stuff like that. So, you know, in elderly patients, there is definitely uh, an increased risk of falls and there's increased risk of spinal cord injuries. Obviously, along with the falls, there's also an increased risk of head injuries because they can hit their skull. So it could be either or or both. And again, if the geriatric patient is on anticoagulants, on blood thinners, then there's a more of a risk of a bleed in their brain, right? Because that will make them more likely to bleed and bleed quicker and show signs and symptoms quicker and stuff like that. Now, how do we stabilize the spine? So the first thing is we don't call it spinal, spinal immobilization anymore. Immobilizing something means it can't move, okay? So we call it basically stabilization. So we've got called spinal motion restriction. We want to stop them from moving, but we're not tying them down. Again, only because they found out there's a lot of problems with somebody being tied to a long board. It's uncomfortable. It didn't really do much for them as far as stabilization. I'll show you why in a second. So we'll talk about all the different ways that we do it in a second, okay? Now, spinal mobilization was the low term, okay? I mean, the old term, I'm sorry. We did it on every patient based on mechanism of injury, okay? It was practiced probably the, the skill that was practiced the most in EMT class. And we made a huge deal about it. So you probably saw in all your years, you know, there was a car accident. They used to drag them out of the car on a longboard, tie them down, put blocks on either side of their head, and so on and so on. That you do not see anymore, right? Or you should not see anymore, okay? Um, and again, that was, that was an overabundance of question, okay? Now you might say, why don't we just do it anyway to be on the safe side? Because everything in medicine is based on study. And what they found was that people who had no pain who were moving all their extremities, moving their head in all different directions, never had a spinal cord injury. Now, could you miss one? Could there be one in a million that's missed? Yes, I'm not gonna lie to you, okay? But if you're talking about the vast majority of patients who are able to move all their extremities, turn their head in all different directions and had no pain, they don't have spinal cord injuries, okay? Now, again, when we told you there's the primary injury, which is actually a problem you know, with trauma to the spinal column or cord. And then the secondary injuries could be that the cord itself is having problems because the person's not breathing well, because the person's in shock, but a person's hypoglycemic. So in those cases, it's not really a primary cord injury. So you're gonna manage the secondary injury. So which means if somebody's showing signs and symptoms of hypoxia, you're gonna relieve the hypoxia by either putting them on oxygen, okay, or ventilating them. So that's all they're kind of saying there. Now, this is what I wanted to show you, the reason why we don't do it before. Okay, so the new terminology is not spinal immobilization, it's spinal motion restriction, which means we restrict them from moving around a lot, but we don't tie them down, okay? Now, the reason why is that picture you laid somebody flat on a backboard, right? So somebody's laying on a hard, on the floor, a hard piece of wood. This is a picture of their spine of how it looks inside the body. So it's not a straight line, okay? It doesn't go in a straight line. This is looking at it from the back, okay? Like if you were standing behind somebody. But when you're looking at it from the side, it doesn't go in a straight line, okay? Now, this is the towards the inside of the body. This is towards the back, right? The, the, in other words, the skin of the back. Your head is over here, okay? So what you basically have is here's the head, and it protrudes, right? Because it's, you know, like this. You're laying them flat. So the head is here, and this is the next spot that's pretty much even with them. And then it curves back in again. So when you laid them on a board, you had a big void. In other words, a big empty spot underneath their neck, okay? And you had a big empty spot underneath their lower back because this is the high point and their head was the other high point. So you can picture if the patient was laying flat on a board, their head's over here, the head was touching the board, their neck wasn't, okay? Even if you just close your eyes and picture yourself laying on the floor, okay? Then their shoulder blades, okay, were touching the board and then their lower back wasn't, okay? And actually part of their, probably part of their thoracic spine is that also. So really what, you can only see the upper half of your face. Oh, I'm sorry. My face is not that exciting, but whatever. Is that better? Okay, so, yeah. uh, so um, that was what the problem with what longboard was. So what they actually found was that the mattress on the stretcher does a better job. So the reason there was such a uh, argument about it was there, you know, they're saying, how could a stretcher, a soft stretcher stop somebody from moving their spine? But what happens is when you're laying on a soft stretcher, you sink into it 
and there was a lot less movement. The other reason there was a lot less movement was, you know, I mean, again, we, I wouldn't do it to you, but if we laid you on a longboard, okay, tied you down, put you in the back of an ambulance, and bounced you for 20, 30 minutes to the hospital, it's excruciatingly painful, and people started to move around, okay, just because it hurt. They couldn't find a comfortable position. So what they really found was that what stops people from moving the most is to put a collar on them, a cervical collar on them, okay, as long as it fits properly, and to put them on a padded stretcher. It doesn't mean we don't use the long boards anymore, but we don't transport patients on them. We may use them to help us move people out of cars, but as soon as we get them on the stretcher, we pull it out from underneath them, okay? So the first step is to stabilize the cervical spine, okay? Typically, that's done by a collar as long as you can get the right size collar on the patient. If you cannot get the right size collar on the patient, it's not useful to use a collar. There, you're just going to continue to hold the patient's head um, and you know instruct them not to move and stuff like that, okay? So even a perfectly applied collar is what's considered a reminder to the patient not to move. It doesn't, it doesn't stop the patient. Like, I, I mean, I'm sure you practice with the collars, hopefully already in class. If you didn't, please let me know because you got skills tomorrow and I'll tell them to make sure you do. But when you had a collar on, you could definitely move your head sideways with no problem whatsoever. And you could, you could also move your head like this with not a lot of problem. So it's more or less a reminder to the patient not to move. It helps kind of stabilize things, but if the patient really wanted to move, they could definitely move, okay? So we do use them still, as long as they're properly fitted to a patient, okay? But if they can't find one that actually fits the patient the right way, then the feeling is just lay them on the stretcher and hold their head, okay? And even when you have the collar in place, if the patient's still moving, you're still gonna have to hold their head, but we don't strap them down, we don't tie them down. We used to tape their heads down to the longboard and stuff like that. So the padded ambulance stretcher is definitely an appropriate means of transporting somebody who you think has a spinal cord injury, okay? So you can use backboards if you have to, okay? Again, you have somebody trapped in a car, you need to slide them out, there's glass and stuff like that. So you wanna put a firm surface to slide them out. It's totally appropriate to use a backboard, okay? Once you get them up on the stretcher, you're going to slide the backboard out from underneath them. So I would say backboards are probably used now, I don't know, 5% of the time, very, very rare, okay? There is a nice device out there called the vac vac vacuum mattress. Uh, I'll show you in a second. Uh, nobody I know in Rockland County has them. They're pretty expensive and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it's uh, it's probably a better device to stabilize a patient. And I'll show you why in a second and stuff like that. So, you know, again, it's not really proven by study that rigid devices like collars are actually necessary in patients who are not moving. If they're moving, it helps to remind them not to move. And again, probably the biggest thing that would stop them from moving is you holding them or holding their head and telling them not to move. So this is a vacuum mattress. So what basically happens is it lays flat, okay? So you can easily get it under the patient, okay? And then there is a big, some of them have actually a pump or some of them have a, a, a big, huge syringe, like kind of like a plunger type of device. But what happens is you're not actually putting air in it. You're taking air out of it. And as you start taking the air out of it, it molds around the patient. And you see how it's kind of basically molding around the patient's head and everything. They're very comfortable. Okay. And they pretty much, once the straps are applied, and even without the straps, do a pretty good job of stabilizing the patient. Some of them actually even have a section that you put between the patient that's part of it, but it goes between the patient's legs. So as it starts to form, it actually fills up the voids between the patient's legs and stuff like that. The body Can we transfer with this? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the, um, the bottom of it is made out of a material that's not going to get damaged by the roadway, by glass and stuff like that. It's like a, a very tough, like, um, whoops, a very tough uh, piece and stuff like that. Um, nobody uses, I mean, I'll just tell you, you know, they're out there. They're probably hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I've never seen them uh, used in, uh, you know, in Rockland County, but they're good devices. They even make similar devices for splinting. So instead of having a whole body wide one, they'll have one that fits over the leg and one that fits over the arm. And they, what they do is they basically mold to whatever position you found the arm or leg in. So there's less movement and they do it like once they, once you take the air out of it, it's like a rock, it doesn't move, you know? And uh, some of them are filled up, filled up actually with little, um, little pellets or beans, you know, like uh, you ever see those chairs that sometimes the kids have that they sit in and have like the bean bag chairs. So they're kind of made something like that, but they do, they're very, very good devices and stuff. Okay, so 
putting a cervical collar on. So obviously if somebody's sitting up in a car, especially a convertible, it's very easy to put a collar on. Okay. And I'm sure now everybody, we practice, you guys practice with this in class and stuff like that. Yes, we have. Okay. So you'd know that when somebody's sitting up, it's much easier to put it on than when somebody's laying down. But with the types of collars we're using nowadays, you know, as long as you practice with it, you can pretty much get it on in any position. In some of the real small cars on very big people, it's kind of a little hard just because, you know, they're big and the car itself is small and you can't get into all the different positions to be able to do it. But you do the best that you could do. And again, you're instructing the patient that you tell them, I, I would always say to them, okay, I'm going to slide this collar on. Okay. And even if I'm kind of pushing on you a little bit, try not to move your head and stuff like that. So a cervical collar is just a temporary, okay, reminder to the patient not to move. That's what it really is, okay? So it limits but doesn't prevent movement of the cervical spine. It helps prevent the weight of the patient's head, you know, because of the, the chin piece that goes up underneath their part from moving and stuff like that. And uh, if it's properly applied, right, proper size and everything like that, it's going to keep the head in a neutral position. So it's not going to stop it from moving and stuff like that. And again, just a reminder to the patient. Um, if somebody's standing up, it's even easier to put it on. Um, I don't know if any of you took classes before and stuff, but years ago when somebody was standing, we used to actually slide a backboard behind them and then lower them to the ground on it. They found that that was probably the most dangerous procedure to do on patients. So now if you had this patient that was standing, so let's say you pull up in a car accident, the patient's walking around, okay? But when you come up to them, they say they have a terrible pain in their neck. They have numbness and tingling in their hands and they feel like their their fingers are numb they can't feel anything so you say okay that's a good story i need to you know i need to get this person to the hospital to get checked out so you can put a you can have somebody hold them and you put a collar on them but now what we do is we actually bring the stretcher right over here we tell them to turn around so their back is to the stretcher and we line them up so that they could sit on the stretcher and then we try as a as a unit to lower them down to raise their legs and lower them down they found that that's a safer procedure then putting the board behind a patient and lowering them to the ground and then picking them back up and putting them on a stretcher. Even in a car, somebody's stuck in a car, okay? And there's, you know, they're complaining of symptoms. It's, they found it's actually safer to put a collar on them and have them step out of the car, okay, turn around, face the stretcher and sit on it. In other words, turn around so their backs to the stretcher and sit on it than it is for us to do what we used to do and you probably practiced in class with the KED and all that stuff. So especially if, the car is small and the KED is going to be very hard to maneuver in there and stuff like that. So again, stabilization, okay. All different ways to stabilize, okay. Here, what they're trying to show you is you see as his fingers here. So if you put your fingers under the bony portion of the mandible, however many fingers it takes to reach the um, top of their shoulder is kind of a guesstimate of the size of the collar you have to use. And that's what they're looking at over here. It's not a precise science. The what really winds up happening is that there's one size of collar called a no neck. I don't know how they were picked on that. Okay, that's the one that fits on most patients. So we usually go to that first. And then once you put the collar on, if you see that the collar is so big that the guy's head is tilting backwards, then you're going to go to a smaller size. Or after you put the collar on, if you see that his chin is not fitting into the collar, in other words, there's a lot of space, it means it's too small, then you would go up to the next bigger size. So it's, there's no problem with putting one on and deciding it's the wrong size and then changing it. The other thing just to realize is if people have earrings on, okay, you just have to watch when you put this on that you're not pressing the earring into their skin because it becomes painful and then they're going to want to move. So you could ask them, you know, if it's really big earrings, you could ask them to take them off and hold them or, you know, whatever. But just that's one of the problems that tends to happen with, uh, with earrings. If women have very long hair, or I guess you could even have men with very long hair, then try to get it up out, out of the way before you put the collar on, because if it's trapped under the collar, it's just not going to make the collar do a good job in immobilizing it. Okay. Again, rigid cervical collar is only used if you have the right size and it fits properly. If not, then skip it. Again, when they're laying on the padded ambulance stretcher, their head is going to sink into the mattress. Okay. And it's going to help stabilize it that way. Okay. If it's too tight, you're going to actually kind of deprive them with blood to their head. You're going to make it difficulty for them to breathe. If it's too loose, okay, it's going to move around and stuff like that. It can shift onto the, in other words, what we're saying is if the chin piece is actually not up under the chin, but is pressing over here, it could actually, you know, kind of choke them and stuff, whoops, choke them and stuff like that. 
Okay, and then too short or too tall, we said that if it's too short, it's not gonna do anything because they can move. It's too tall, it's gonna flex their head backwards and stuff like that. Okay, so again, patients who have been, uh, who have spinal cord injuries, we found in all different types. I mean, they could even be under the water, right? So you get a story, somebody dove into the pool and they, you know, they couldn't, they didn't come to the surface. Somebody jumped in and rescued them. And the patient stayed, he's floating in the water with that person saying, I can't move. And now you have to get them out from the water. It's going to be basically the same thing. You're going to put a collar on them, okay? And you may have to either try to use a longboard to float them up on top and then get them out. But as soon as you get them out and get them onto the stretcher, you're going to pull them off the longboard and leave them on the padded ambulance stretcher, stuff like that. Now, infants and children, okay, it's a big problem. There's not a lot of sizes, okay, of collars, and there's a lot of different sizes of kids. So years ago, we used to say to take a towel and kind of roll it up and put it around their neck. Nowadays, they're really saying if you can't find the right size, okay, collar to fit the kid, again, just put them on a padded ambulance stretcher. Um, you know, that this whole thing with the collar and stuff like that, you're jerry rigging and it's not really probably the right way to do it. So just put them on the padded ambulance stretcher, have the mother or father hold their head, and that would be fine. Okay. Um, so now somebody's in a car. So, okay, somebody's in a seated vehicle and stuff like that. If the KED, okay, which that's the vest mobilization device, if the patient's stable, there's no problem, you know, wait, taking five, 10 minutes to move them and it will fit in and you'll be able to get them out. In other words, you got to remember the patient may be too large, okay, or the car may be too small. If that's the case, you just have to document that the reason you didn't use it is that it didn't either fit on a patient and, and that's something you should eyeball before you even try to do it. Like the, if you see a patient's, you know, a large patient, you know, it's not going to fit. Okay. It's just not going to fit right and stuff like that. Or if it's a tiny little car and you're having a problem even getting it into the car behind the patient, then you're just going to pull them out. You're just going to either have them stand, stand, like I said, slide where their legs are facing out, stand up, you know, put the cervical collar on them, have them stand up and then turn around and face the stretcher and sit down on it and stuff like that. High priority, First, unstable, one second, unstable patients. Okay, we just move out as quickly as we can. We get a collar on them, but we just move them out. In other words, if you have somebody who's crashing, you're not gonna take 10 or 15 minutes to move them out of the car. You're gonna put a collar on them and you're gonna move them out as quick as you can. Just keeping in mind that you wanna minimize the amount of movement of their neck. Yes, what's your question? So Ellie was showing us there is that in the ambulance they had this long type, I don't know what it's called. Maybe you can help me with that. Um, it's like a basket. It's a red, it's a oh, red. Oh, um, a scoop stretcher? Maybe. He was saying does that it they break, it. Does it break into two pieces? It's like a whole bunch of pieces. It looked like, the bot, you know, it came like folded up and he like opened it up. And he was saying that, you know, when someone gets lost in the wood, or like someone gets like a hiker. Oh, is that a, a Stokes basket? A basket stretcher, you're saying like? Something like that. Stokes. Something like, he means yeah. a Stokes. Yes, Stokes. Okay. Can you, can so you transport and stuff so, like that? Or? Yes. So, so again. It's going to problem with that is going to be there's no padding. I'm just going to there's a lot of background noise, so I'm just or just mute yourselves for a second. Um, there's not a lot of padding in a Stokes, so the problem is the patient can move around a little bit, but there is a harness system built into it. You know, there is straps built into it. So, I mean, I guess you can. It, it really, most of the times on a um, a Stokes, it's somebody usually without a spinal cord injury. But I would think as long as you'd put some, maybe t rolled up some towels and put them on either side of their head or something like that, um, you could probably do it. That may be a situation where you may have to use some tape to keep their head from moving. Because if you're using a Stokes basket, you're saying that the terrain is not, you know, it's uneven. It's like rocky it's, or hills or something like that. So the real advantage of the Stokes basket is that you can get multiple people holding it. And there's actually a wheel. Like if you're back in the woods, there's actually a wheel that goes underneath it. You know, let me show you what I'm. I'm talking about, um, hold on one second. So Oops. 
That's not good. Well, I mean, I guess you can kind of see it in here. So it comes with an actual harness system that kind of holds the patient in place. Some of them even have like these little blocks that go around the patient's head. This is what I was telling you about. This wheel detaches and can be carried in separately and it goes underneath the thing. So if you're coming out of, you know, if you're walking on a trail with a patient, okay, then you could have four guys, two on each side, and they're basically just rolling the patient and it's air filled. So it kind of bounces over the, um, you know, little rocks and stuff like that. So it's you know, definitely a, a nice device. This one looks like it has a little more padding built into it. Let's see. Yeah, so this one looks like, well, maybe just where the patient actually lays in it. Looks like there might be a little more padding in it and stuff. But, uh, you know, there's all different kinds. And the, the ones really for, um, like, back rescue. Uh, so you see here, you can lower people. You can hoist them up to the helicopters and stuff. But I'm just trying to see if there's, uh, well, here you see they are, they are hoisting someone. You see here it breaks into pieces and they actually come with a backpack so you're not like just carrying it in your hands let me just see uh, yeah so here so that's a whole stokes basket broken down into pieces and they just carry it in a backpack. And then usually somebody carries the wheel um, separately. You know, it's got a little harness and stuff like that. But they're great devices. I mean, we even use them sometimes on the side of the throughway. If the car went down the embankment, it's much easier to move the patient back up. And sometimes you could even just, you know, if you have to, you have a tire rope to it. So four guys kind of try to bring it up the side while the guys in the top are pulling on the rope and it, it works. Uh, you know, works much better than just trying to, you know, the guys that are holding it, trying to move it up and stuff like that. Okay. Is water a safe place for an EMT? A lifeguard would say no. So again, the, the only time water is safe to be in is one, if you can swim, and two, if you try not to go in deeper than say knees to waist would be pretty much the most, but there's still no even guarantee because you could be walking in you know, and then go into a deep hole or something like that. And, uh, you know, so, I, you know, if you know how to swim, it's not that big of an issue. But um, really, most of the times, you know, water rescues and stuff like that, um, probably better off left to people with flotation devices and everything. You know, you have to remember, there are places where, you know, the EMS is part of the fire department, so they have all that equipment. There's places where the EMS is not part of fire department, but still carries additional types of equipment and stuff. It's just in Rockland County, when they were divvying up responsibilities and stuff like that, we don't really carry a lot of that extra equipment. When we first started here and we were in much bigger vehicles um, than the Suburbans, you know, they were kind of like trucks. We had a ton of space, so we carried a lot of different stuff. But as the years went on, you know, we never really used it and it was an expense. So we kind of got away from, uh, you know, using it. Okay, so there's different types of devices for people that are sitting in a car. So the vest, the KED, the vest is the main one we use, okay? Whenever you're immobilizing, it always goes that you immobilize the torso, which is the chest and body first, and then the head last. There's a very simple reason. If you tie the head into the device first and the patient starts to vomit and you don't have the rest of the body tied in, and now you're gonna turn their patient on their side, okay? But the head is secured, the rest of the body is going to fall, right? Because you're turning them on their side. The rest of the body is going to shift downward and you're going to injure their neck. Where if you do their body first and they start to vomit, somebody could hold their head as you're turning them and then there won't be any movement. So it's always going to be that you do the body first and they say the body being the torso because the torso is really everything above your hips, okay? And below your head. So it's your chest and abdomen. You always do your torso first and your head last, okay? Um, any part of your body you need to assess, you assess before you lay them flat, 
right? So before you put them on stretcher or anything like that, if you have to assess their back, you have to do it before you put them on the uh, stretcher. Okay. Okay, again, they're showing you in a convertible, which is not really fair. So they're showing you they're putting the KED behind a patient. There's a collar in place already. Very, very easy to do, but very rare that we have people in car accidents in convertibles and stuff like that. Okay, um, the term log rolling a patient is when you put the board alongside them, okay? And you roll it, you roll the patient up on their side, you put the board behind them and you roll it back on. So that's really something that you can only do, um, you know, in class. We can't really, I'll show you, but you can't do it. If you remember, we were talking about pregnancy and we said one of the problems when you lay a woman flat is they could have this supine hypotensive syndrome, but I told you it's not so common anymore because we don't really use boards, but that's the weight this is a third trimester emergency. So the, you know, the baby's already large. And then if you lay them flat, the weight of the baby presses down on their inferior vena cava and doesn't let enough blood back to their heart. Okay, so what happens with pregnant women, if for some reason you were using the long board, you would just wanna tilt the long board a little bit, okay? So that that pressure is not on them or anything like that. What is a KD? A KD is this, so you should have practiced it. The KD is what they call the, the vest type device that wraps around the patient when you're trying to move somebody in a seated position. Did you practice with this in class? What's that? Yeah, they showed it together with the- with the Long board? Fracture. Not a long board, with the, um, for the femur fracture. Oh, the, uh, the traction splint? Traction splint, yes. Now you say they showed it, did you practice with it? Oh. I know how to use it, I don't know, they didn't show it really, no. Okay. I don't think I haven't seen it. Okay. No, we don't show it. No, we didn't practice. Okay. 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 I will talk to them tomorrow. Actually, I'll send them a text and say, you know, do, now did you practice with the traction splint? Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah, sure. There's a station for that. Okay. Right. So this is not something you're going to be tested on on the practical skills exam because we don't really use them anymore or anything like that. Okay, so it says when immobilizing a younger child, we talked about that the back of their head is kind of is what they call pronounced, means it kind of bumps out a little bit more. And as you get larger, it you know your head obviously gets bigger, so the bump in the back is not as, as prominent, they talk about, it doesn't stick out as far. So there's the issue, and I showed you the picture of that when a kid is laying flat on their back, their head is gonna make their head flex forward. So that's a, you know, that's gonna put their, their spinal, um, their neck, it's going to move the spine in their neck. So we basically have to put some padding under their shoulders. Okay. We're really under their back to raise up their back. So it's the same height as that part of their head. So I'll show you that. I have a picture coming up and stuff like that. Okay. Car kids that were in car seats in car accidents years ago, we used to use their car seat. Okay. But the feeling now is that you don't know how old the car seat is. You don't know if there was a recall on it. You don't know if it was injured in the accident. So they don't really recommend using a car seat that a kid was in in a car accident. So they recommend you know, not doing that. Most of the ambulance nowadays carry some type of inflatable car seat that you can use okay, to secure the kid in the ambulance. Um, or in the captain's seat, there's actually you fold down the part that you actually press your back about and there's a built-in car seat. So it really depends, but there's usually in every ambulance built in some type of device to transport a child in, okay? Um, and I can show you some other things, you know, when, when we have a second, we take a break or something like that. What time is it now? 9.45, 8.30, 9.30. Okay, let's, I think we're almost done. So let's see if we can just get through it. Okay, so a log roll, again, is only used on a log board. I think I'm gonna have pictures and stuff like this coming up. So. Again, somebody's supine on the ground. Somebody's going to stabilize their head. We're going to put a cervical collar on. Remember, when you're doing that, you're going to take the part, the, the, the bottom part, the tongue, they call it, slide it under the patient's neck, and then bring this part over to meet the tongue where the Velcro is that it connects and stuff like that. Okay. Now, a long, uh, uh, now, did you guys practice this, like log rolling patients? Yes. 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 Okay. So what you're going to do is that the person at the head is going to call the commands. Usually you need at least two people over here. Okay. And when this person says ready, I'm going to count of three, one, two, three, you're going to roll the patient. Now, obviously you have to make sure that the side you're rolling the patient on is not injured, but you're going to roll the patient on the side. And then usually you have a fourth person that's going to bring the board underneath the patient, and then you're going to lay them down. So they're rolling them on the side. Okay. 
This is her showing you she's checking for injuries, okay? And they don't show you, but you should be bringing the board. And sometimes what we actually do is kind of lift this part, this side of the board, so it's kind of on an angle underneath them, and then we bring them down. Some people prefer, instead of putting the board just like here, because when you lay this person back down on a board, they're not gonna be in the center of the board. You're gonna have to push them sideways to get them on the center of the board. So some people prefer that instead of keeping the board just like this, they take this part of the board and make it line up, okay, just below their, um, their buttocks. So now you lay them down and their head is about over here. And then you would have that same person holding the head one person grabs underneath one arm, she comes over onto the side, grabs on the other arm. And then again, a counter three, this guy counting three, you move them not just this way, but you move them over towards this side so they're centered on the board. Okay, so it's just another way of kind of centering them when they're in place. And then once you have them down, even if you're just gonna be lifting them up on the stretcher and then getting them off the board, you still need to strap them because the last thing you'd wanna do is drop the person off the board. Okay, so this is again showing you with some patients because their head is so high up, okay, that you may need to do a little padding um, to get them in a position. With kids, it's gonna be the opposite. Kids, you're gonna actually need to pad over here. But some people, their heads for some reason just don't touch the board. So you don't push the head down, okay? You just actually pad underneath them and stuff like that. So this is showing you the kid's head is large, it's flexing forward. So by putting some padding under his shoulders, the head is in a neutral position and stuff like that. Although he does look like a, COPD, COPD patient with an emphysemic patient with a barrel chest, okay? So this is what we don't do anymore. It's fine if you need to do this to just move them, but we don't transport them, okay, you know, uh, on the stretcher, I'm sorry, on the backboard like this to the hospital. Too much claustrophobia, too much pain. And again, not that you see it, but underneath their neck is not touching, underneath their lower back is not touching. So remember the spine goes from the base of the skull all the way down to the lower back. So if those parts are not touching, then it's not really doing it. But if they were on a padded stretcher, it would be doing a good job, right? Stuff like that. Okay, so the best type device, the KED, is for the seated patient that's very, very stable, okay? Sometimes you may have somebody like, I don't know, they fall through like, a, I don't know, a hole in the floor or something like that. And you, you know, you're trying to move them minimally. If you get the KD on them, just to move them up out of the hole in the floor, that might work or something like that. I mean, these are all very, very, you know, um, um, rare types of circumstances and stuff like that. If you take a kid and put them backwards in a KED, um, it actually works as pretty, you ever see a kid getting sutures, getting stitches? They have the, what's called the papoose that wraps around them that keeps them from moving. So a KED is kind of, can be used in that, um, in that way also to kind of stabilize them. But we, you know, it's not really for spinal mobilization and kid and stuff like that. Now, when you do it in a car, the collar is gonna go on first. When you're gonna put the KED behind them, you have to shift them forward enough to be able to get the KED behind them. So, and then the KED should go, so the top of these is actually up underneath their armpit, right? So it has to go down far enough. And one of the things that could happen is that this piece of the KED that's kind of stabbing up, depending on sometimes it actually gets caught in their pants. So if you're having problems shifting it down, push it into the seat, or I do this all the time. I kind of push it into the seat and then slide it along the seat. I don't slide it along the person and then you're less likely to um, you know, catch it on their pants, okay? And then once you get it behind them, you, you bring them back into the device and then you're gonna apply the straps. Again, the, the straps go that the torso is connected first, the legs, and then the head. So, you know, it's usually middle, bottom, legs, top. The reason we wait for the top strap to last is the top one that interferes with breathing the most. Okay. Then once you get that all strapped, then you bring the head back. If the head will not meet the KED, you put some padding and then you strap the, um, the head in. But remember, you're doing this for a literally, it takes longer to put it on than it's going to stay on the patient. Because as soon as you get them out of the car, you're going to take it off them right? And you're going to leave them on the padded ambulance stretcher. So it really, most of the times is not used. I mean, I have not seen one of these used in years and stuff like that. So they're showing you all the different straps, okay? The leg straps are a real pain in the neck to get in place. So they're showing you on an old model, you know, four-door sedan with lots of room. You know, nowadays cars are much tighter, so you don't really have that much uh, room. I'll just tell you, if you can, if the seat is real forward, 
making the seat go backwards is much easier to be able to do it. Sometimes you could tilt the steering wheel up a little bit. So the more space you could make for yourself, the better it is and stuff like that. The KD does come with these uh, little straps, but the problem is that, you know, they get lost or sweaty or dirty. So most of the times we just use either tape or a roll of gauze around it. Okay. And then they're reassessing pulse motor sensation, which you do before and after you put on the device. They're pulling the patient out of the car. So this was actually, it looks like a pickup truck. Okay, so they're pulling the patient out of the car up onto a longboard, this is the old way. And then, you know, they were gonna strap them to the longboard and transport them to the hospital on the longboard that we don't do anymore. So all of this up till now, even pulling them out on the longboard, if you need it as a bridge from the car to the, long, to the stretcher is fine. But eventually the only thing that's gonna be touching the patient would be this mattress right here. And that's the only thing that you would really use. Okay, so rapid extrication uh, means that all you're gonna do is put a collar on them and pull them out of the car because they're so unstable. So we're just gonna put a collar on them, not worry about the KD, not worry about the longboard. We're just gonna pull them out as quickly as we can to get them out of the car and stuff like that. The rapid takedown was the way that we used to do the standing patients. Again, we don't do that anymore. So all you would do if you had a standing patient is put the collar on them, bring the stretcher, have them turn around with their back to the stretcher, try to line them up. So wherever they're sitting, they're kind of in the middle of the stretcher. You have them sit on the stretcher while you're supporting their head and then you pivot them so that they're in their, you know, the right position to have their legs up on the stretcher and stuff. So we don't do this anymore. There was just too, too much movement. I mean, you can see what's happening now to, to do the patient and stuff like that. Um, five more minutes will be done. Helmets, okay? So bicycle helmets, not an issue. They come right off, no problems. We're talking about football helmets, you know, uh, helmets that kind of motorcycle helmets, the helmet that kind of go around the patient's head and stuff like that. So if a helmet is, is, is not damaged, snuggling on a patient's head, okay, and there's no problem with airway, you can actually leave the helmet on the patient, okay? So what it has to be, the helmet's not damaged, there's no problems with the patient's airway that you would have to manage and stuff like that. But what you're gonna have to do is pad under their shoulders, because obviously the helmet is sticking out a lot further than their skull was, and it's gonna flex their heads forward. So you're gonna to have to pad underneath there and stuff like that. Now, if there's a problem with the patient's airway or it's not fitted right, or it's broken or anything like that, right? Then you're gonna to have to remove the helmet. So if you have to work yourself. Okay, so the questions you would say is, can I continue to assess the patient's airway if I leave it in place? Okay, is the patient's airway okay? Do I need to do anything? So in other words, if any of these are no, you have to remove the helmet. Okay, so that's what basically the questions are. So any of these, no, the helmet has to come off. So let me ask you, did you guys practice taking helmets off in class? Nope, okay. not yet. Okay, well, class is almost over. Okay, so here's the deal. If it has a full face, it's really hard. If it has a half face where this piece is not here, it's very easy. That's what it really comes down to. Okay, um, so I would think in the Jewish world, you're not gonna find a lot of kids playing football with helmets on. So you're probably the only thing you're gonna have is um, hel motorcycle helmets. So again, some motorcycle helmets, I don't know if any of you ride motorcycles, the real fancy motorcycle helmets that are full face helmets actually have a button alongside that you could press where this folds up out of the way and it's very easy to put it on and off. The cheaper ones, it's actually in place rigid. So it's a little hard to be able to do it. Okay, so the first thing you would do is the strongest person you have would hold the helmet in place, okay? And what's gonna happen is after the patient comes out of the helmet, their head is gonna wind up falling, okay? So this person's job is going to be support the weight of the head, you'll see in a second. So this person is stabilizing the helmet. This person is removing the chin strap, okay? This person is now, pri well, if you see, she's kind of has one hand under their neck supporting and then one hand in the front on their chin, okay, supporting it like this. This person is now actually pulling sideways and stretching the helmet. And then you have to kind of stretch and rock the helmet because the nose is in the way. So you have to kind of rock the helmet back and forth. It's kind of hard to describe it so that it's starting to slide this way and not catching their nose, okay? Um, and what's gonna happen is once he gets this off, all the weight of the head is being supported by this lower arm so she has to have this part of the arm actually on the floor so that when the head comes, she just doesn't fall. You know, in other words, she's able to support it and stuff like that. So you see, they're clearing the nose, they're pulling it out. You could see her fingers down here supporting it, okay? And 
Whoops. Okay, and then the head's going to come out, and then he's helping once his hands are off the uh, the helmet. Okay, and then from there, it's just a cervical collar, just like you normally would. So in other words, you're just you had to get the helmet off for some reason. Okay, this is what I was showing you on the fancier helmets. So this is when you pull up. This is what it's going to look like, and you're going to say, "How am I going to get this off his head?" And in all honesty, you couldn't. But there is buttons on the side. I don't remember exactly where they are. Maybe it's this one. I don't remember where they are. Yeah, maybe it's this one. Usually the patient knows if they're conscious. Um, that actually makes this come off and it comes off it as a breeze then. All you have to do is, you know, basically pull this in this sideways and it comes right off. The nose doesn't get caught and it comes off pretty easy. So I guess this is the button, but I don't see it on I guess it's only on the Usually it's under the chin, right next to the chin. They have a button. That one on the right side, that's for the glass to pick up. You can either okay. pick up only the glass or the whole front thing. Okay, so where's the button? Uh, up they in would here? Have it, yeah, somewhere in there. They should have it, like in the corner, I believe, or somewhere like that. I don't know. They make a few types. Yeah. But these helmets, like some of these helmets could be a couple hundred dollars. I mean, these are very, very, you know, talking like five, six hundred dollars. These are very, very expensive helmets. Okay. Football helmets, usually at a, a football game, okay, they will um, they will have what's called a trainer. A trainer is the person who takes care of the kids and the equipment and stuff like that. So usually the first thing that you could do is the face mask actually screws into the helmet. <coughs> so you could see he has a screwdriver. Now they actually have a battery-operated drill, and you take the face mask off. That gives you the ability to be able to, you know, look at their airway, manage their airway much better. Then we usually pull off the chin strap and we make a decision if we not need to move it. Usually once you remove the face shield and the chin strap, the helmet comes off pretty good. Unless they have very, very expensive helmets that actually have inflatable cushions in here that they, after they put the helmet on, they pump a little air in to make sure it fits tight. Those are a little harder because you have to deflate the cushions, but the trainers know how to do that. You have to deflate the cushions before you can take it off. Okay, so again, patient. Now, the other problem is shoulder pads. You have to take the shoulder pads off or no, if the kids, the, the, the kid's shoulders are going to be much higher, which means the head is never going to reach the, uh, the mattress. So these have to come off. Usually there's ties in the front and there's straps under the arm to make them come off. So they come off pretty easy. Okay. Um, injuries to the face. So, you know, the biggest thing we're worried about with the face is the jaw, the lower jaw again, because the tongue is attached. I've, you know, I've had some, I've had like fish hooks in the face from kids, you know, uh, they were fishing with their friends and somebody wasn't paying attention. I've never had a fish hook in the eye, but the problem with the eye is that the eye is actually a fluid filled um, ball so that what's ever impaled in the eye, we leave in the eye because if the fluid drains from the eye, the eye is lost. So it's better to bring them to the hospital, whatever is impaled in the eye, okay, uh, in place. And then the uh, ophthalmologist will take care of it. Or um, uh, yeah, ophthalmologist, not optometrist. The ophthalmologist will take care of it or do what they can to take care of it. Um, so the orbits are the bones, the ring of bone around the eyes. The nose, you know what it is. Obviously, trauma to the nose can have a lot of bleeding, which can interfere with the airway and stuff like that. Um, again, eyes, pretty rare. Um, so again, there's two chambers of fluid. There's the front chamber that's called the aqueous fluid, the back chamber that's called the vitreous. So you hear vitreous and I don't know what aqueous is, aqueous. So they're filled, both of them are filled with fluid. So really the shape of the eye is caused by, it's like a, a bag full of fluid, the eye and stuff like that, okay? So here there's actually a fish hook stuck in the eye, okay? So all they did was cut it from the rope, cut it from the fish line and stabilize it in place. There's nothing else to do. Now. The whenever you the, the way the eyes work is whatever one eye is doing, the other eye is doing. OK, so you have to cover the injured eye and the uninjured eye if you want to stop movement, because if you just cover the injured eye and you leave the uninjured eye uncovered, when they move their uninjured eye, their injured eye will move with it. So you always have to cover both. OK, this is just showing you different types of things you could see in the eye. Okay, so a blowout fracture means that the eye is actually protruding out of the orbit. Okay, hyphemia is that there's bleeding inside the eye itself from like blunt trauma to the eye. I only saw this once when a kid was hit straight 
okay, in the face with a ball and it hit his eye and stuff like that, okay? Um, you can have um, kind of burns to the eye, typically the welding torch. That's why they, the welders wear a special mask with a special lens in it and stuff like that. It could also happen um, from people that go skiing. They always, you see when they wear the goggles, they have a tint on it. So the, the, the sun, if you're high up on a mountain, hitting the white of the snow reflects back and cause a very painful sunburn. Most of the times it's temporary, okay? But they're basically blind and they have kind of a burn to their eye. Um, so there's nothing to do other than just cover their eyes and bring them down. Usually put moist sterile dressings over it and just bring them down and take them to the hospital and stuff like that. Now, I think I told you we had a student in class that had this. We had a student, a very dedicated student, you know, it was probably, well, he's probably my age now. He's probably in his 50s, so he's a little old for EMT class, but very dedicated, never missed a class, did every skill and everything like that. It was very towards, pretty much towards the end, right before we were doing the practical, he was practicing longboarding and he was helping lift the longboard off the ground with a stretcher on it. And all of a sudden, as he stands up and he brings his head back, he says, oh my God, I can't see completely out of my eye. And I said, what do you mean? And he goes, well, half my eye, you know, has blackness. And that's called a curtain effect. In other words, as if you're drawing a curtain or a shade, you know, across the window. So that means you detach the retina. The retina is basically a, um, well, really like a shade that moves back and forth uh, across your eye. So when you detach your retina, okay, you'll get this, you know, this kind of thing. And it's a surgical fix. They need to have an ophthalmologist, you know, fix it and stuff like that. So going to the hospital, the important thing would be to cover both their eyes and actually minimize any quick whipping around of their head, because the more they move their head, the more likely they are to make the injury better and stuff like that. If they talk about sudden painless loss of vision, okay, sudden acute means, you know, just all of a sudden, painless loss of vision in one eye, they had a stroke in their retinal artery, okay? So it's called retinal artery occlusion, okay? Uh, again, nothing to do but cover their eyes and bring them to the hospital. And then it's just a matter if they're lucky enough if the, um, the blood clot moves and, and they get blood, blood back and stuff like that. Um, as far as the mouth goes, probably the most common, you know, blunt trauma, hit in the face type of thing, loose teeth, can cause an airway problem. Um, if there's a tooth completely knocked off and the root is intact, if you could just put it in some, you know, nice clean water, if you have sterile water, that would be even better. Um, they really say the best thing for it is the patient's saliva, having them spit in a cup and put it in. The problem is if a tooth was knocked out, there's going to be a lot of blood. So it's, I don't know, people kind of get grossed out by it. But you want to put sterile water, not sterile saline. Saline is kind of salty, but sterile water um, will keep it as best you can before until you get them to the hospital. Tongue lacerations, typically when people have seizures, sometimes they'll, they'll bite their tongue or again from trauma. Okay, lip lacerations, you've all seen when a kid falls and cuts their lip. It's, you know, any of these could be dealt with, well, the lip much easier than the tongue, but with direct pressure. Okay, and again, a loose tooth, um, you would want to just, uh, you know, keep in uh, some sterile water and stuff like that. Okay, nose, the only issue we have is uh, bleeding. So the issue with nose bleeding is there's two parts to your nose, right? There's, let me see what picture, do we have a picture of nose? Well, let's say here. This part of nose we see is called the anterior nose. So if there's bleeding from down here and we pinch the sides of it, we can do a good job con controlling it. If the bleeding is any place past that, including you have your whole nasopharynx behind it, there's nothing we could do to control that bleeding other than get them to the hospital. There's no way, they have to pack what they call pack their nasopharynx. They have a special device that puts a, almost looks like a tampon, but a big compressed gauze pad that expands once it gets back there and puts pressure on it and stuff like that. So nothing we could really do for those except get them to the hospital. I've never really had injuries to the ear. I had one time with a fight where somebody bit somebody's ear and I had one time where a bug crawled into somebody's ear. We just took them to the hospital. Again, if it's exterior soft trauma, you would just hold pressure on it and stuff like that, okay? Um, you don't wanna put anything into the ear canal, okay? And they're talking more of head injuries and stuff like that. And on a test, they'll always say if there's anything draining from the ear, you should put a uh, sterile dressing over it just as a barrier for infection. Okay, we don't really do it, but that's what they could ask. Okay, your mandible, remember, is your lower jaw. Okay, and the problem with the mandible is the tongue is attached to it. So if the mandible fractures, there'll be a problem with the patient being able to keep their tongue. 
Uh, laying them flat usually is a big problem. So usually we have them sit up, okay, and then support their lower jaw just to keep their tongue up out of the way. Most of the people I've seen with mandibular fractures or sporting injuries like hockey, boxing, football, and stuff like that, and they're usually holding their own jaw, okay, and leaning forward and drooling because they can't swallow um, to keep their airway drained. So you just help them, you know, in doing that and stuff like that. Remember, impaled objects in the cheek are the only time we can remove an impaled object in the body. We're allowed to always shorten an impaled object, but to remove it, it would only be the cheek. And again, for two reasons, we can get to both sides of it to put pressure, okay? And it may interfere with the airway and stuff like that, okay? Uh, neck injuries, well, we talked about the spinal cord injury and stuff like that. Um, hanging injuries, if somebody hung themselves but still alive, you would always suspect the spinal cord injury and stuff like that. Um, clothesline injuries means that, not that somebody hit a clothesline, but it means that somebody traveling at speed hit like a cable or a chain that was across two poles, like somebody was blocking off a parking lot or something like that. So that could actually fracture their neck and cause a spinal cord injury that could rupture their trachea and cause breathing problems. So, you know, it's kind of hard to say what you have to do depending on the situation. Here's a kid who had got a piece of wire, okay, impaled in his neck, but was still conscious, alert, and alert, and breathing. Um, and, you know, they, they basically intubated him, pulled the wire out, okay, and he did fine. Okay, you know, all different types of, again, somebody fell on a stick, conscious, alert, and oriented. So again, he was knocked out, intubated, taken to the OR, and they pulled it out. It turned out he didn't have any real injuries and stuff like that. Somebody stabbed right in the spine, but moving every part of their body. So there was nothing really, you know, they, they basically, again, brought the patient to the operating room and pulled it out. So there's a lot of, now this was a famous picture. This was a hockey player. I don't know if you know the hockey skates, when they're sharpened are like knives, right? So there was a crash between two hockey players and the other guy's skates went up underneath his helmet and slashed his uh, juggler vein in his neck, okay? So, um, so he basically fell to the ground, pulled his helmet off and blood, you see all the blood that came out. The trainers ran out and held direct pressure the, the ambulance is always stationed at the hockey stadium. There's always an ambulance there. They wheeled the stretcher out, put him on, and rushed him to the hospital. And he actually did wonderfully. He had no you know, long-term issues because somebody held direct pressure right away and stuff like that. Remember, it's most likely going to be veins if it's closer to the surface because ar arteries tend to be deeper and stuff like that. Okay. Um, now, one special wound that I think we're done that could happen, or one special incident, I've never seen it, never heard of it that could happen is the juggler vein. So this big blood vessel right here is your internal juggler vein. The one you see on the side of the neck is your external, it's much smaller, but this is much deeper in. So remember, veins are bringing, this vein is emptying from your head down your neck into your chest, right? Because the vein is always going back towards the heart. So an artery would be blood under pressure and would be pushing the blood out. A vein, when it's cut, just kind of oozes. So a large vein has the ability to suck air into it, okay? Now, this is really, they only talk about it being the juggler vein in the neck that could really do this, but there's a possibility if somebody has a deep laceration that severed the juggler vein, they could actually suck air from the outside into their bloodstream and cause a massive air, air embolism, right? And we could go to the lungs and cause a pulmonary embolism. So if you remember, there's, there's four times that we put what's called an occlusive dressing. Does anybody remember what an occlusive dressing, O-C-C-U-L, ISIVE, occlusive dressing is? It keeps it tight, right? It, does pre it prevents air from entering. Right. So there's three times, okay? There is a hole in the chest, and that we said we seal it on three sides, okay? If you have a gunshot wound, a stabbing or something on the chest, and that was called a sucking pneumothorax, right? I showed you that picture of the guy that was shot, and it was actually breathing through the hole, right? So that's where you'd seal it on three sides, and if the patient got worse after you seal it, you'd have to break it and then reseal it, break the seal and reseal it, and break the seal and reseal re it. The other two times were an abdominal evisceration. What was it? What's an abdom abdominal evisceration? E V I viscer, S C E R I. I don't know. I have to whatever. What's an abdominal evisceration? That is where somebody was cut across their abdomen, and what came out? Their intestines. The organs, the right, whatever, the, all their the stuff. The intestines, the kidney, right, the kishka. So all that stuff comes out, okay? 
And we said there we want to wrap it in the, the intestine in a moist sterile dressing and then put plastic or an occlusive dressing over it. So the one in the chest is to stop air from coming in and out. The one in the abdomen, we seal in all fire sites. It's basically not to prevent air, but to control temperature loss. Because if you ever see on a cold night, right, sometimes you see the heat coming out of people's mouths. So the same thing, if you cut open somebody's abdomen, they're going to lose so much heat so quick. The last time is an injury on the neck. And again, that has to be sealed in all four sides. Now, what I'm going to tell you is this is, this is a test question. You're never going to be able to do it in real life because if somebody had a bad wound, right, a, pul a um, jugular vein lacer excuse me, lacerated on the neck, there's going to be a ton of blood. Nothing is going to stick. No tape, no nothing. You can't just wrap the tape 360 degrees around their neck because you'll strangle them. So what we basically do, okay, is use our gloved hand and hold everything in place, okay? Um, there's no other way to do it. So in other words, whatever you're going to do, on the test, you would answer, you would tape it in place, right? It, four sides, airtight, because you don't want them to suck air in the wound. But in real life, you're probably going to just take a four by fours, gauze pads, whatever you have, pack it in place, okay, and hold pressure and take them to the hospital. Because in real life, there's no way you're going to be able to tape on four sides on a neck where it's going to be airtight and stay. It's just going to, the blood is just going to wash, you know, make it impossible for it to stick or anything like that. Okay. Um, so on the test, Okay, all four sides, okay, and stuff like that. We don't remove any penetrating injuries to the neck, just like we don't remove any penetrating injuries any place in the body, so any impaled objects, any place in the body, except for the, the cheeks, okay, uh, anything else. Again, most of these patients obviously are going to have to go to a trauma center, okay, nothing too exciting. Injuries to the front of the neck, right? So anytime somebody has any fractures to their trachea, they can immediately... Um, shut their airway off. And there wouldn't be a thing in the world you could do to save them because it requires a surgical cut into their airway to be able to manage them. So on a BLS level, you try to ventilate them, you probably couldn't get air in or anything like that. Um, I've never seen somebody injure their esophagus that we knew about it. I've seen people, when the CAT scans come back, say they actually tore their esophagus or something like that. Um, the problem is that the upper part of the stomach Right, we said digest food by acid, the lower part of the stomach digests food by bacteria. So if the esophagus is torn open and any of that acid or bacteria enters in out of the esophagus into the chest or the abdomen, it's gonna cause you know massive either burning or trauma or infection or something like that. But there's nothing we would know or be able to do and stuff like that um, to be able to you know manage that. Okay, I just wanna show you two things. You were very good, you stayed on a long time and stuff, but just two things, because it doesn't seem like people um, remember those two terms. So just give me one second. So, so we can find a good picture. Uh, nope, that's not gonna work. Well, I mean, I think, can you, can you see the screen? Do I have to re share the screen? Let's see. No, we can see it. Okay. So what they're basically showing you is that how they kind of put a moist, a moist sterile gauze pad over the actual intestine. And then you can see the plastic that's going over it. But let me just show you what it looks like without a dressing. So you can see all different examples of it. Okay. So it could really be a massive cut where the intestine is completely out. It could be a small, where just as a loop of bowel, it really depends, you know, where the where it is, how big it is, and stuff like that. Okay. So a lot of different ones. I mean, I had people at cuts where, you know, this is probably the patient's down here, probably the patient's liver trying to come out. So it's so big that um, you know, it can't fit out. But here yet all the intestine came out. So Very rare, only see, see it, you know, saw it once or twice and stuff like that. 
so this is definitely what side of the body is this? This is the left side. So this is this is probably his stomach actually coming out over here. So, so again, moist sterile dressing. Okay, and an airtight dressing over it as best you can. Um, what else did I want to show you? Oh. How do they put these things back in? I mean, they're so huge and humongous. Like, what do, what do they stuff it back in? Like, what do they do? So the problem is that a lot of times, you know, well, first of all, they usually have to obviously open up the stomach, you know, open up the walls, so to speak. I shouldn't say stomach, but open up the abdominal cavity and fit everything back in. The problem is that um, they'll, they're always going to have problems. So there's a thing called adhesions. So right now your your intestine, right, is moving a little bit inside your um your stomach, right? It's moving around, not your stomach, your abdominal cavity, moving around a little bit and stuff like that. Um, after it's some, for some reason, after it's taken out of the body and put back in, like when you have surgery, you can develop what's called adhesions, which means the actual intestine, the two, like they start sticking together. So you got tubes and they're starting to stick together. The problem is that they're not designed, they're designed to move freely. So when they stick together, you're more likely to get, you know, blockages, obstructions and stuff like that. So it's, it's probably very difficult. I mean, I'd have to say, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a mess. I mean, you got to remember all that has to be cleaned before it's put back in and everything. So it's, 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 it is probably a mess. Okay. So when somebody has a chest wound, uh, an open chest wound, you know, exposed to that you could see it, the concept is you're supposed to seal it on three sides. Some people say seal it on four sides and leave a corner. Okay. But the issue is you can see there's blood underneath it already. So blood is very sticky. Okay, so what's going to happen is that even though, so what, why are we doing this? I guess is the first question. When they breathe in, this prevents any air from coming in because the, the plastic sticks, right? When they exhale, if they're exhaling out of the hole, right, they're going to relieve the pressure in their chest. That when they're exhaling out the hole, it's supposed to lift the plastic and the air is supposed to come out of here. Sometimes what happens is it doesn't work because the blood, okay, causes the plastic to stick down well. So then what you just do is gently lift it up. If you see like it's look, looking like it's trying to inflate, but it's not coming out, you gently lift the plastic and break the seal so they could vent the pressure. And that prevents them from developing a tension pneumothorax in their chest. So, you know, I mean, there's, and there's, you know, this is the, 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 the meatball way of doing it, but um, you know, there's devices So that thing is like a valve, like a one-way yep, check very good. valve. Yeah. Okay. So like there's commercial devices, right? This was one of the original ones. Um, you know, that instead of putting a piece of plastic, this peeled off, you lined up the hole with the vent over it. So when the patient was inhaling, this collapsed, right? And no air went in. The patient's exhaling, it stood back up. There's better ones out there now. Um, let me just. So this is the one we're using now. Let's see if it. So it actually sticks. Oops. It actually you peel it off, and it, huh, I don't know why I keep on getting it. You actually peel it off, and it sticks. And what happens is that there's these channels. You can see them. And the air actually vents out of these channels and blood actually vents out of it too. So you don't have to worry about the blood causing it to stick. So that's the ones we're using now, uh, but there's a whole bunch of different ones out there. Uh, this one has the valve built into the middle of it. Right, so there's a valve built into the middle of it there. So it's all different ones. Um, the usual BLS ambulances don't carry any of these, but um, you know, it, um, It's, I don't know why, I mean, there's no, there's, I mean, other than expense, you know, it's, it's probably a better device than just taking a piece of plastic and the average ambulance probably doesn't even have a piece of plastic to be able to do it with. Okay. So any questions on anything we went over tonight? So I believe this week we're meeting on Wednesday and Thursday night, and we're going to be doing um, pediatrics and geriatrics. And really, after that, I think there's only one or two more lectures. 
So uh, we'll have to squeeze in, you know, I guess I, we'll do again next month's Shabbos. Um, maybe start doing some actual test question reviews and stuff like that. Um, you know, start getting ready for the exam. Okay, because it seems like there's a few things that some of you, you know, have have uh, forgotten from the beginning part of class. So we'll start doing some actual test review and stuff. Okay, so does anybody have any other questions or anything they want to go over? Nope. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Um, obviously, I was looking at the pictures you showed me with the intestines out and everything, and I felt like I'm going to vomit up. And <laughs> now, a, couple, a couple of you told me why that. Why do I say it? Why do I say it? If right. I'm getting to a scene and I find this, and I'm, I mean, I'm not going to be able to approach it or to do the proper things. Will this be called patient abandonment or something? No. Well, first of all, you'll be surprised. Um, so I never thought I could be a paramedic because when I was growing up, in school, they showed a picture of people uh, abusing heroin, shooting a heroin into their veins. So they actually showed an up close view of the needle going under the skin into the vein. And I literally fainted. I just my head hit the table, you know, and the blood came, you know, the blood came out of the needle. And you just I, I, so when I I don't know, when I decided I wanted to be an EMT, I had the same thought in my mind, like every time I see blood, I'm going to faint and stuff like that. So typically. Uh, what happens is when you are the person, you know, who has to help the person and you have adrenaline flowing through your body, it seems like people don't usually panic. I did have one EMT faint in the back of the ambulance when I was starting an IV one time and we never saw him again. I guess he just figured it wasn't for him. But uh, most of the times people, you know, get used to it. I'll tell you what has changed in me in the last, say, 10 or 15 years is the sound of somebody, what they call retching, like trying to vomit, um, I can't deal with it anymore. I actually have to leave the room. I cannot deal with it anymore. Um, you know, earlier, my kids, you know, you heard your kids vomiting, whatever, you know, you went in and helped them. It wasn't a problem. But the sound of somebody vomiting now makes me want to vomit. So I, you know, I've had two or three calls, you know, uh, over the years now uh, where people were vomiting and I just stepped out of the room till they finished because I was like, I'm going to vomit with them. And not uh, a problem. I don't hear you. That's not a problem to leave the, the scene. No, you're not what? you're not leaving the scene. You're just stepping out of the room for a second. You know, I mean you're not stepping out for 10 minutes, right? You're how long does it take? So but I, I can't we deal need with to it. Suction, no? What's that? We need to suction if it's a virus. Well, Actually. these are con these are conscious patients vomiting. So they're not unconscious patients. Typically unconscious patient vomiting don't retch. Right. Retching is that uh, sound, you know, so unconscious patients, when they vomit, they're not retching because they're unconscious. So they're just it's just coming up. There's no sound to it or anything like that. It's the people, you know, it's the, it's like your kids when they were throwing up. You know, I mean, it's just uh, it's terrible. My son got food poisoning. Have the choice of feed him at night. What's that? Feed him night to have it. <laughs> if you when you when you drink wine, feed him. Oh, 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 you mean when the kids are <laughs> intoxicated and vomiting? Yes. Yes, absolutely. You can uh, you can have that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you do. The, listen, you, you know, you got to do the best you can do. First of all, I'll say pretty safely that most of you will go through all the years of being EMTs and never seeing an evisceration. OK, I just got to be honest with you. You could ask, you know, you could ask 100 people that are EMTs if they ever seen an evisceration. They'll say pictures of it. You know, or if they did tell you, they're probably lying to you. It's just not common. That's one thing I'm looking forward to. <laughs> so, but, and actually, you know, even I think more more nervous for me is, or, or about you guys, is uh, a whole bunch of people, you know, either texted me or, or sent messages about the, uh, the childbirth video, you know, how it was disgusting and it was this and it was that. Well, you know. If you're going to be an EMT in the Jewish world, you're, gu you're guaranteed to be delivering a baby. So if you can't get past that, then, you know, that's going to be a problem because out of all things, I would say I feel fairly confident that you're going to do. It's going to be delivering a baby. So that you're going to have to figure out how to work your, you know, work your head around that. So I okay. can't wait for it. You can't wait for it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. So any other questions? OK. Oh, somebody was sending texts. Let's see. Um, oh, I guess I missed a whole bunch of things. Let's see. Hold on here. I didn't see this. Where are we? So somebody asked what a KED was. So I told you that's the vest type device 
that we use for spinal mobilization when it's sitting in a car. So when we use it is a totally stable patient in a car where you suspect they possibly could have a spinal cord injury. And again, I told you um, it's very rare. It's very rare. You know, pretty much nobody uses it. Um, if something gets stuck inside, question mark, esophagus. Uh, Mendel, what are you asking me? You said that there's no... Oh, well, 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 you got a huge echo. You had mentioned that there's no um, trauma to the, esoph to the esophagus. I'm wondering what happens if something gets stuck in there. Oh, it, that could definitely happen. You know, I've had, uh, I've had kids who swallow things. But again, it's not an emergency. They will, most of the times, they'll just let them, they'll give them, um, I forgot the name of the drug. There's something that relaxes the esophagus and they'll let it go down into the stomach and see if it'll pass out and poop it out. I have a kid swallowed nickels, quarters, dimes. They usually just poop it out. Um, I'm talking that sometimes in trauma, you know, shot, stabbed, you know, blunt trauma, whatever, the esophagus could actually rupture. But again, I've not seen anybody with an esophageal blockage. It's possible. I've seen people, I've heard of people who had tumors that pushed on their esophagus and how it was determined. Like every time they tried to eat, they, they couldn't get food through. It got harder and harder to get food through and they were vomiting and stuff like that. Like every time they ate, it was very difficult for them to swallow. And then on CAT scan, they found out they had a tumor pressing on their esophagus. Um, but I've never had anybody with esophageal trauma that, that we knew in the field, it's after they do the CAT scan, they come back and tell you everything that's wrong. And then they say, oh, by the way, they tore their esophagus or you know, something like that. You. Uh, you can try smelling hand sanitizer. So, oh, so odors, right? So, so sounds and odors, right? So like what, what interferes with us being able to take care of patients? So yes, so you know, sounds of people vomiting bother me. Odors, not so much but the sound of somebody vomiting bothers me. But some people, it's the odor, it's the smell that bothers them. So um, yeah, I mean, open the windows. Nowadays, we're wearing face masks anyway, so it's probably a lot less as far as the odors go and stuff like that. Somebody said try and smell hand sanitizer. You know, I don't know how much of an odor that has, but I guess you could try it. Um, there are people who carry Vicks, V-I-C-K-S. Vicks is the, the stuff when your nose is congested, it's menthol uh, that you put to help like it smells very like pine uh, needles, like clear your nose. There's some people that carry that to put underneath their nose if, if, they, if smells really bother them because it's a stronger smell. So it masks the, the bad odors and stuff. Um, probably the worst smell um, would be like dead bodies. Bodies have been dead for a while and stuff. But if, you know, once you see they're dead and you see their bodies breaking down and, it's, and the smell, you leave. You know, I mean, there's not any reason to stay there at that point. Um, so... So, well, you know, probably what we should do, right? Uh, the first night of EMT class is, is expose you to all these different things so you could decide if this is something you want to do. So, okay, so anything else we want to go over? Okay, so I'll see everybody Wednesday night. Okay, I will send out the handouts uh, probably tomorrow and um, we'll go from there. Okay, yep, so everybody, thank you. everybody have a good night. Take Thank care. You. If you want to remind me to do the bag valve mask, whoever wants to see it. The not the pop bag valve, okay? Not the bag. Oh, the pop off valve. Yeah, but there's a whole bunch of other things. They never practiced um, log rolling, KD. They never actually practiced it. They saw it. So there's a whole bunch of things we went over tonight. They said they never actually practiced. Helmet, right, helmet, so helmet removal. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to send a text now. I'll let everybody know what needs to go over. All right. Take care. Thank you.